done so much for us. And I got thinking about all the times that he's, he's gotten us out of trouble and all the times he's healed our bodies and all the times he's, he's paid that bill. But you know what? I'm thankful for all the stuff he didn't do. I'm thankful for all the times he kept me from that accident. I'm thankful for the times he kept me from that financial disaster. I'm thankful for the times I didn't have that sickness I thought I was going to have. I'm thankful for the time I didn't have the problem that I thought was coming. And so I am so thankful for all that he has done for us, for everything that he hasn't had to do for us, because he's that good. He's that almighty. He's that all powerful. And there's nothing too hard for God. Why don't you turn to a couple people next to you and just give them a short testimony. Say, hey, guess what the Lord did for me this week? Guess what the Lord did for me this month? Guess what I'm expecting the Lord to do for me tonight? Jesus, we thank you. Oh, you've been nothing but good.
worship the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Let's let him know we're here. Hallelujah. Let's let the Lord know that we're looking for something tonight. Hallelujah. Let's let the Lord know that there are needs in the house tonight. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, glory to your mighty name, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Mighty God. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Two weeks ago, pastor contacted us and said, uh, would you guys like to try something new? And they told us what it was. And we were, yeah, definitely. So tonight, you will be witnessing, I think, the first time, at least official time, here at FAC, a tag team event pastor's idea. It hasn't even started yet. But uh, speaking of pastor, they're going to be heading home in a, in a day or so, and uh, let's uh, lift up a, a prayer for them that they'd have a safe trip home. Uh, they've been gone for a couple of weeks. That's a long time. But the building's still standing, so we're doing pretty good. But uh, they'll be back. They'll be glad to be back and, and see all of us. And uh, also, we've got a, a youth event going on this weekend. We want to pray for that in Jesus' name. Let's go before the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, mighty Lord, mighty God, for the good things that you've given us. In Jesus' name, mighty Lord, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for your protective hand, mighty Lord, as you would keep your hands on the the coxes as they head back. In Jesus' name, mighty Lord, we are expecting, mighty Lord, a great move of God among the young people this weekend. In Jesus' name, mighty Lord, touch each and every person in this congregation, mighty Lord. Those in need of healing, those in need of financial help, in Jesus' name, whatever the needs may be, mighty Lord, we're praying, mighty God, that you are going to move and have your way. We thank you and we praise you, mighty Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. We got the youth going out tonight. The subtle way. I didn't know if she was going to be sitting over here. She's hiding in the corner there. So for tonight. 45 minute time limit. Introducing first, originally from Princeton, Illinois, 40 years in this area this year. Well, you came over young. She can kill you with her smile. Her smile is so addictive. Best friend of 40 years, my bride of 37 years, the Taminator herself, Sister Tammy. Hey, Sister Mary, do I got that look on my face? She said, she said when I'm up to, up to no good, I get this look on my face. Her tag team partner for tonight, originally from the south side of Chicago, the baddest part of town, graduate of the College of Ancient Knowledge, bites the heads off of hamsters, Your very own, Brother Bob. Like I said, this will be a tag team event. For tonight, we're going to be talking about spiritual reproduction. So let's go, let's, as you stand, because I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to open up. Second Corinthians 5.11 Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, 
we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God and trust also are made manifest in your consciences. In Luke 19.10, the reason why Jesus came originally for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, let's pray before the Lord. In Jesus' name, mighty God, we're asking you one more time, mighty Lord, to touch and anoint the voice, mighty God, tonight in Jesus' name. Mighty Lord, your word is already anointed and it will not come back void. In Jesus' name, mighty Lord, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory and we are expecting to get a, a harvest, mighty Lord, in Jesus' name from your word as we plant it and as we sow the seed in Jesus' name. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You might want to move your chair a little bit closer. She's so shy. Can you imagine putting up with somebody like me for 40 years? <laughs> she earned that gray hair. There are 8 billion people or so on our planet right now, in Jesus' name. And spiritual reproduction is the only answer that we have to give. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19 reads like this. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of of reconciliation. And Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Forty years is also this year the anniversary of myself getting saved. Uh, I actually repented uh, halfway through 1983, but it took me six months just to get rid of the most uh, intense of my bad habits. But started the, started the year of 1984 in a storefront, an apostolic Pentecostal storefront in Blue Island, Illinois. In March, I got baptized in the name of Jesus. When I got lowered into the water, it was almost like I was breathing under water. After I came out and on the ride home, I felt lighter. Something had happened. I'd been through supernatural experiences before, but nothing like this. I was clean from the inside out. It was powerful. It was life-changing. But there was still one more Thing that I had to accomplish. And it was going to have to be something that I could not do for myself. I could repent. A preacher could baptize me in the name of Jesus Christ. But being filled with the Holy Ghost was the task of the Lord. And May of that same year, I got filled with the Holy Ghost on a Sunday night. I hadn't even wanted to go down to the altar. I was tired of people shaking me and spitting on me and all of this other stuff. I was, I, I'm sitting this one out tonight, Lord. And the Lord said, you go up to the altar, I'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. So I went up there. I started worshiping. Less than five minutes later, I was speaking in tongues. And I went back and sat down. And the assistant pastor at the time said, do you know what happened to you? Yeah, I got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. In the meanwhile, the, another guy who had gone up to the altar was up there and, he was, you know, one of those guys. But he got the Holy Ghost that night too, so it was okay. <laughs> so, all of a sudden, it hit me. That clean feeling that I felt, that light feeling that I felt when I got baptized, all of a sudden, was coming out of my mouth as the evidence of speaking in tongues. 
I, 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 wanted, I wanted to do that so bad. I mean, it, was, it was such a, a if, if you've ever endured a lot of supernatural stuff, you, you can see why Simon the Sorcerer wanted to buy that power, because it was unbelievable compared to anything the occult world had to offer. Here I am, being filled with the spirit of the almighty God. And all that cleanness that had, that had been done in me was coming out of my mouth in tongues. Oh, it was, I loved it. I went to work the next day, and uh, I was there by myself, so it didn't matter. And it's like I kept taking, speaking in tongue breaks. Because I just wanted to keep on doing it. World evangelism. Evangelizing means making Christ known. Acts 5.42 says, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Jesus' method was that of multiplying disciples. Matthew 28, starting at verse number 18 and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Jesus had some mass evangelism that took place under his ministry. 4,000 and then 5,000 when the multitudes were fed. But he also had a personal ministry. The personal ministry or the evangelism by Jesus started off with Peter and Andrew by the sea. Nicodemus in John 3, 5. The maniac at Gadara. The paralytic in Mark 2, 5. The Samaritan woman Zacchaeus, the tax collector in Luke 19, the adulterous woman in John 8, 11, each one of those people individually had to be dealt with in a certain manner. He applied his message to them where they were in their life. He got up and he ministered to them. He made it personal. Personal evangelism by the New Testament church. All evangelism is personal evangelism. Daniel 12.3 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. We have... Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. We have Saul by Ananias and Ananias in Acts chapter 9. Cornelius by Peter. The Philippine jailer by Paul. Lydia in Acts chapter 16. Almost Agrippa in Acts 26. And Governor Felix got a little bit of a talking to in Acts chapter 24. This kind of evangelism is involving establishing. The 12 apostles were called by Jesus and then mentally and spiritually transformed. People that work with you, if you remember, hopefully they changed how you thought. Someone maybe who, who witnessed to you, who told you about the truth. Uh, even though there was a, uh, an apostolic Pentecostal church there in Oak Lawn, not far from where I was working, the Lord had to reach down and pull up a backslidden girl. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know anything about the truth or any of this stuff. But I started going out. She was a sister of a friend of mine from up at the rink. No idea. I saw her picture. I don't even know why. She's a, she was a, in the picture, she was a bleach blonde. I don't even like blondes. But you know, all of a sudden, oh, you know, who's that? Well, that's my sister Kathy. But she's into some weird religious stuff. Well, I had already repented, and I was looking for weird religious stuff. So I uh, started going out with her, and she over a beer told me about 
Baptism in Jesus' name. I told you she was backslid. Anyway, but I start thinking and, 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 and contemplating baptism. All I'd known is what went on in the Lutheran church, and I was too young at the time to, you know, with the, with the sprinkling stuff that, to, to really appreciate it. Now, some of you maybe didn't grow up in church, and somebody brought the message to you. And hopefully they had wisdom, and they applied it to you. Okay? The 70 had also been called and mentored by Jesus. They were taught from the scriptures the things concerning the kingdom of God. 3,000 new Christians from Pentecost were immediately taught the fundamentals of the faith. Acts chapter 242, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Acts 246, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did they eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Beyond the job training, Jesus mentored his leaders. He spent much time with the few preparing them for the task of evangelizing others. He wanted his disciples to be able to know what he had done. He wanted to put the tools of know-how and truth into their hands. The Apostle Paul equipped his converts for ministry. They very capably ex executed the charge of evangelism and care of the churches. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit you to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I'm not jumping in from the top rope. That's not happening. So, continuing, Paul explains the purpose of ministry. In Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 12, it says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some um, pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The purpose of the ministry is to train other believers for their ministry, not to do it all while everybody sits back and watches. So if we are saved, if we say we have a pastor, we have an evangelist, a prophet, a, a teacher, a apostle, all of that over us, the reason God has given that to us as a church body is so that we as the entire believing body of Christ are equipped to do the work of the ministry. It was never supposed to be where 90% sit out there and 10% do all the work. It's 100% do all the work. That's what we need. The complete Christian, the complete Christian has been converted, has been taught, has been trained, and then they go out to convert and to teach and to train others. So what you've received, you need to pass on. What the Bible says about soul winning People frequently use the phrase soul winning or winning souls as a reference to our Christian responsibility to witness. Witnessing is sharing our testimony. If, if somebody is in court and they're called as a witness, what are they supposed to do? They get up on that stand, they swear to tell the truth before God and everyone, and they tell their first-hand experience about what they saw, what they did, what they heard, Etc. But it's firsthand, and they swear it to be true. They don't get up and talk about something else that they heard somebody else say. That's called hearsay evidence, and it's not admissible in court. They relate only what they personally know to be a fact for themselves. Right? So when we witness to people... We can't just say, hey, I heard about this person that had X, Y, Z happen to them, or there's a story in the Bible that tells us blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying those things are bad to talk about, but talk about what God's actually done for you, that person standing right in front of them that they are having a relationship with right now. Relate your testimony. Give your testimony in that court for their soul. 
and stand as a witness. So we are called. It is our Christian responsibility to witness. It is our Christian responsibility to evangelize. And evangelizing is preaching the gospel to the lost. Yes, there is a part of the fivefold ministry that um, an evangelist is someone who's going to reach for the lost, going to try and reignite, uh, revive the saints if they're a little dead. Um, they might be an itinerant preacher and go from this location to that location. But that is different than what we are called to do. We are called to evangelize also. We are called to go to our world and to find the lost and to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ and the promise that is theirs if they will follow and obey him. So we need to witness, we need to evangelize, and then we need to disciple. And discipling is to teach and to train new believers. So it does us no good to bring a child into this world and then leave it on the delivery table at the hospital and walk away and say, well, there's another one born into the kingdom. No, you need to take that baby home. Take care of that baby. It's hard work. But if you'll train up that child, if you'll nurture that child, they'll grow and develop and be healthy, and then they'll one day reproduce. Most believers do not realize that the phrase soul winning or uh, commandment to win souls is not in the Bible. It's not anywhere in the King James Bible. People do like to refer to Proverbs 11 and 30, which says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. This verse is often referenced when discussing soul winning. But this Old Testament verse refers to gaining influence with others. You've heard of Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's the kind of winning this is talking about. Be smart with people, and that's a wise thing to do. You want people to buy into whatever you're doing, whether it's, you know, family or business or neighbors or whatever. Um, it has no reference to converting people from false belief to truth. Okay, are we getting that? That this is not what Solomon is writing about in this proverb. He's talking about use your EQ, be smart with how you deal with people. If you'll do that, you'll be wise. And it is important to be wise when we're trying to reach the lost. It is not good to be a jerk with people when you're trying to reach them. It is not good to, to not be responsive or to not read social cues. There's two types of people, right? Those who can read social cues and those who can't. The big problem is those who can't don't know that they can't. And so that's why you end up in these really strange, weird, long, yeah, cringy conversations and you're trying to back out of the room and you can't get out fast enough because we're not reading social signals. So we need to have wisdom that we understand that. So since soul winning isn't in the Bible in this sense, what does it mean? Well, we all know what it means when somebody talks about, I want to be a soul winner. We know exactly what they mean. We, we know that what they're talking about is evangelizing the lost, sharing the gospel with people, seeing people come to the Lord and get saved. So we're going to talk about that. Those who focus on soul winning rather than witnessing tend to focus on one person, and they spend all their time trying to reach them. And they will use badgering, guilting them, bribing them, etc. Because they're going to be a soul winner. They're going to get that one person. And they just chase that person down. And even when that person has shown no interest at all in changing their life, they'll keep after that person. Because they're convinced if they can just wear them down, they'll get them saved. They may or may not be successful. Frequently, they take their results personally. They either feel validated if they see it as a success or they feel crushed in failure. You ever been working with somebody for a really long time and you feel like you're right at the precipice and they're just about ready to make that commitment and then they're just like, ah, I don't want this anymore. And they walk away and you're like, ah, and you feel like you've just lost a child here. When you are focused on soul winning in that sense, you take that really hard, and it's really hard to recover from. In the meantime, while you're chasing after that one person that you thought for sure, I can get this, I can get this fish landed. In the meantime, we've likely ignored all the other lost souls and not invested any time in witnessing to the others. Soul winners will use a single line to catch one fish, 
and they decide who that fish is. You ever hear people say, well, we need to get more doctors and lawyers in this church. You know, we need people that have financial blah, 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 and all of this. That's not anything that the Word of God tells us to do. We need to spread that far and wide. Those who focus on witnessing rather than just soul winning focus more on reaching as many as possible. When the goal is witnessing, we can be 100%. Everybody say 100%. 100% successful all of the time. Results are not our responsibility. So we do not take that outcome personally. When souls are saved, all the glory goes to God. While they remain lost, we go to God in prayer for them. Witnessing allows us to interact with the greatest amount of people in the shortest amount of time. Nowhere in the scriptures, in, in the New Testament church, do you see the Apostle Paul just going back to one person, one person, one person, one person, one person, and ignoring everything else. They were scattering the gospel as far and as fast as they could. And because of that, they reached 10% of their known world at that time. 10%. That's amazing. We have 8 billion people in the world. What is it, like, what, 800 million people would be 10%? That's phenomenal because they were witnessing they weren't going after just one at a time. If I can just get that magic person in. Um, so while they remain lost, we need to do that. Witnessing allows us to interact. And then witnesses use a net. So soul winners always just have one line going after one fish. Witnesses use a net to reach as many as possible because the Bible says whosoever will. So the reason that I've changed my language personally to not to try not to say soul winning anymore um, is because we cannot win souls. I cannot win a soul. Only Jesus can win a soul to himself. That is his job. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new cre creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We are to serve the purpose of reconciliation. Ministry is servanthood. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So it's our job to serve the purpose of reconciliation between man and God, and it's our job to give them that word of reconciliation. We have that ministry and that word of it, of reconciliation, but only God has the power of reconciliation. We can't forgive their sins. We can't know their heart. We can't fill them with the Holy Ghost. We can't do any of that stuff. All we can do is share the gospel, give them the, the keys to salvation that were laid out in scriptures and teach them, witness to them, evangelize them, show them all of this, and then let God do the work in their life. We cannot win a soul, but we can bring them to the one who will win their soul. He'll win them to himself. The believer's job is to witness, Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. The power is not just so we can be blessed, so we can do cool party tricks and speak in tongues and heal the sick and raise the dead and do all these groovy little things, but it's so that we could have the power to be witnesses in this earth. And all that other stuff will come with it. Trust me, it does. But we need to be witnesses in all the earth. The second part of our job is to evangelize, Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So don't just go after one. Go after them all. Share it with everyone. And, and then disciple. Matthew 28 and 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things what I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So when we are discipling them, we are teaching them to observe all the things that are commanded in this holy word. 
We are responsible to do the work. We are responsible to sow the seed. We are not responsible for the adults, for the results, provided we have done our part to the best of our ability. So that doesn't mean you don't study, you don't pray, you don't love them, you don't do all of that because, well, it's all up to God. You have to do your part to make sure you're doing your very best to be available and be usable by him. But the results are not dependent upon us. Tragically, some, many, may not hear and will be lost. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be, many there be, which go in there at. Many will go to hell. Many will be lost. The question is, will they be lost, never heard hearing the gospel? Or will they be lost in spite of hearing the gospel? And we are responsible to make sure that they have heard the gospel. Our witness is required regardless of the result. Luke 9 and 5 says, For whosoever will not receive you when you go out to that city, shake off the dust from your feet for a testimony against them. So even if they reject it, it was still the will of God for you to say it. Because that's going to stand against them in judgment. They can't go to the Lord and say, Well, nobody ever told me what I needed to do. Nobody ever told me about you. Nobody ever shared how you, how you went to the cross for my sins and you died and you were buried in a tomb and three days later you rose and, and, and now you lived forevermore to, to save me from my sins so that I could be baptized in your name and filled with your spirit and walk in the way that you want me to. Nobody ever told me that. But if we'll tell them, then the Lord, I think, will just kind of play a repeat. He'll be like, oh, yeah, I did know that. But... It's a solemn responsibility we have, but we have to do it. Once they've heard the gospel, it becomes their choice. They no longer have the excuse, I didn't know. Some believers have become discouraged, and they have given up on trying to reach the lost because they felt the results were their responsibility or that they just weren't called to be a soul winner. The enemy has used this wrong thinking to effectively cripple the church in their evangelism efforts. Be patient. We will see results if we continue. When someone is growing a prize vegetable, fruit, or flower or something, they just focus on that one plant, trying to get that flower stem to go perfectly straight, making sure nothing touches that ginormous zucchini. They don't care. They just want the recognition that comes from having the best plant at the show. But when you have a farmer who's trying to feed, they will see that entire field and do everything they can to make that harvest healthy. And so that is our responsibility. If we'll just keep at it, we'll see the results. Be patient. In Galatians 6 and 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Spiritual reproduction. Every normal, healthy, living thing reproduces itself. Many Christians don't. Why? Not super Christians, but all healthy Christians should evangelize and preach the gospel to the lost. Not just people who are in the pulpit. Not just people who feel that... that that they're beyond others. Everyone, each and every one of us. The plan of action, also called the Great Commission. John 20, 21, then they said to them again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Matthew 28, back to 18 and 20 again. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Teach, baptize, and teach again. New Christians need to be discipled. 
You can't just, like Tammy says, you just can't, you know, baby's born, you just leave them on the table. Oh, well, good, they, they just got born. Wow. Now, there are times that she says that I was raised by wolves, and she wasn't far off. But when you birth a, someone into the kingdom of God, you've got to be there for them. That means you sacrifice money out of your pocket. You sacrifice vacation time. You sacrifice any other things that you've got going on other than work. Because you are discipling people. You are the ones who are feeding them. We've got a lot of parents and grandparents in here. You know how the little ones have to be taken care of. On their own, they're going to start standing. On their own, they're going to start trying to walk. Some of them just tried crawling. When, when our son was little, he started crawling, but he was crawling backwards. Robert, what are you doing? And he'd be crawling backwards. And then he'd get to that little room divider, and he's climbing up the thing. Couldn't walk yet. Couldn't even crawl straight forward. But I, we had to watch him. We didn't know what he was going to do. And it's the same thing with these, these new Christians that we're discipling, that we're, we're, we're working with. We're helping them get their feel, get, so they can walk that walk of faith. Teach, baptize, and teach again. The taught ones are to become teachers then. Our son Robert's in the ministry. Having a, he's having a great time with the stuff he's doing down at the campgrounds. He, has a, a, he, he runs a whole bunch of stuff up in the church that he, he's going to. I try, he, he told me, yeah, Dad, I want, I think I'm, I, I want to get into the ministry. I tried to talk him out of it. You what? Yeah. Because if I could talk him out of it, he ain't called. Because if you're not called to be in the ministry, don't take that on yourself. More people have taken the mantle of ministry, official ministry, on themselves and have made shipwreck. The Bible warns us in the New Testament, you don't take this on yourself. So I tried to talk him out of it. I couldn't do it. And boy, he showed me. Believers are to produce leaders. Oh, I thought we were to be the leaders. No, you're supposed to be training people to take your place. So you can go on and do something else. I mean, since, since I, 40 years I've been in, I've done so much stuff. I, we, we were youth ministry for eight years, assistant pastors for 20 years, all other kinds of stuff, all other kind of jobs, whatever needed to be done, we did it. Things had to be done around the church. We didn't, we were taught you don't wait to be told. You get up and do it because you're supposed to be ministry. Ministers are servants, you know, not prima donnas. If this is work, it's a labor of love. Implementing this plan of the Great Commission. How can we win the world to God? Let us start with one soul. Let us plan in our minds to spend a year finding, teaching, and discipling this soul to Jesus Christ. At the end of one year, there will be two Christians in the world. The second year, two will go out into the world and find two more, spending the whole year again to win a soul and then disciple them in such a manner that they could teach and disciple others. At the end of two years, there would be four born-again Christians in the world. This type of progress seems painfully slow, but consider the growth factor. By, five to 30, by, by year five, 32 people would be Christians. By year 10, 1,024. By year 20, 1, 1, 48,576. By year 33, this number is so big I can't even... Huh? 
eight and a half trillion. I'll just read the numbers. Eight, five, eight, nine, nine, three, four, five, nine, two. Hike. Never underestimate the power of one. God desires to use every Christian to reach the lost and make disciples for Christ. This is the key that unlocks the biblical secret of how the early church grew. This key also unfolds to us the possibility of reaching our entire world with the gospel before Jesus comes. God's world harvest. It, the, he has a law that this goes by. If we are to hear Jesus say, well done, then we must do well. To reach the lost requires the matter of sowing and reaping. If we want to bring in the sheaves, we must get in the field and sow the seed. Psalms 126 and verse number 6, He that is going forth and weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. How many out, out there are learning something tonight? I mean, you might know everything. I don't know. I know I don't. It's just when I start thinking, oh, that's something new. How am I going to top this? God tops it with something else. God's got all kinds of like cool junk that he wants to spring on you. In the scriptures, there is spiritual power to create new life. We have depended on and have tried many things, but we have often failed to believe that the word of God will not come back void. The teaching of the word Sowing seed will result in a harvest of lost souls. I'm sure I'm not doing that the way that he envisioned, but, <laughs> you know, Internet is forever, so... <laughs> All right, so every Christian should be involved in the business of reaching the lost for Jesus Christ. Um, fervent desire will motivate a believer to make a special effort, even when it's inconvenient, to reach the lost. We must go where the sinners are. They will not come to us. When I was uh, raising uh, my children when they were younger and I was working from home and doing a lot of that, it was very frustrating because I rarely ever met anybody new. The only time I really encountered people that were lost was like if I went grocery shopping. Um, I knew everybody in the neighborhood, but didn't even really see a lot of my neighbors. Um, and so now that I'm back working in the working world, it's wonderful because you meet so many people. Um, and you, they all change on any given moment. They change, and so you get to meet new people. But you will have a hard time reaching the lost if you never encounter them. If the only place you are is in your home and at church, you're going to have a hard time to meet people that need to hear about Jesus. So you need to make a special effort to get out there and go places, meet people, talk to people in the grocery stores and when you're out. So just keep that in mind. Um, they will not come to us. Reaching the lost is not, oh, I hate to say this, it's not inviting them to church. Inviting them to church is good. That's very good. This is an awesome place. And you are amazing people. But we are commanded to take the word to them. Not to make them go somewhere else so somebody else can share the word of God with them. So if all we do is ever invite them to church, but we never ever witness to them and tell them our personal testimony... We never, ever open up the gospel and share that with them. We are just shirking our duty and hoping that one day they'll show up here and hopefully somebody here will do that job for you. But it's our job. It's each one of our jobs. If God put them in your world, in your sphere of influence, it's your job to then reach them. 
So every Christian needs to be involved in the business of running souls for Christ. The field in the home. So Acts 5 and 42, and daily in the temple and, and in every house. They cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. The home is a prominent place for evangelism for the original church in Scripture. The farmer leaves the storehouse or the barn, and he travels to the field to plant the seed. He will not try to sow the seed in the barn. Anybody ever do any gardening, planting, have a farm, have family that was in farming? Did they ever plant it inside the barn? No, they went out to the field. And they planted it in the field. Because if you do it in the barn, it's just going to get trampled and underfoot. It's not going to grow right. It's not going to get what it needs. But you need to get outside of the barn in order to work in the field. The early church was daily in their homes, ministering the word. Jesus and the apostles essentially taught home Bible studies. Matthew 10 and 12, Jesus said, when you come into a house, salute it. Luke 19, 9. Um, Zacchaeus, this day is salvation come to your house. Acts 2 and 46, this is the disciples. And it said, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Um, Acts 11 and 12, this is dealing with Cornelius. And the spirit bade me and we entered into the man's house. Uh, the Philippian jailer. And his household were saved, Acts 16, and they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And then Acts 20 and 20, Paul is talking and he says, and I have taught you publicly and from house to house. So that place where you live, whether it's a mansion, whether it's a dump, whether you've got everything the way you want it or you're barely scraping by, that house was given to you as a place to reach others. And you can do a lot of work. And you can also go to others' homes. Anybody uncomfortable with that? Sometimes, right? Yeah. Do they really clean? <laughs> Did they just, like, wipe their nose on something? Like, ugh. Anybody else a germaphobe once in a while? And it's a little uncomfortable when you go somewhere you're, you don't know. But you can go to their house. You can go to your house. You could go to a Starbucks. You could go to a restaurant, a little coffee shop. You can go to the library. You can go all kinds of places that aren't necessarily within these four walls. Because sometimes churches are scary for people. And we need to go where the people are and not make them come to a special place before we'll tell them the truth about all that God has for them. So whatever situation you find yourself in. Paul, most of the acts, when you read through the book of Acts, most of the encounters they had with people took place in homes, and it took place in, in public places, out on the streets, in the, in the public coliseums, and things like that. Very little of it takes place in synagogues and temples and things like that. So keep that in mind. You don't necessarily have to be the preacher preaching from the pulpit. But every day you walk out your front door, you're in your mission field. You're right there. Being a missionary has very little to do with geography. It has everything to do with the mission. So get mission-minded and God will use you. 21st century disciples are still called to reach and teach the lost. Even new Christians can reproduce themselves through witnessing, sharing their testimony, and teaching Bible studies. We must practice sharing our testimony. So these are important tips. Keep it simple and short and interesting. Two to three minutes tops. If we can't share our testimony in two to three minutes at the most, then we are making the testimony about us and not actually about what God has done. So we need to make sure that our narcissism is checked so that the glory of God can shine through us. Don't use confusing religious language. You know, Brother Bob was talking about speaking in tongues. Well, you know, we're kind of in a situation now where I think a lot of people know what that is. But he was talking, uh, he shared with me before how he was telling his friends about, we were dancing in the spirit, and they're thinking there's some out-of-body experience going on because they don't understand this kind of jargon. Um, you know, even sometimes like, ooh, we were shouting at the church last night. And you're like, shouting, like yelling at each other? I don't understand. So... 
Watch the religious jargon. Don't tear down other beliefs. Oh, you know, I used to go to that Bill and Fran's Church of Fun, and let me tell you, they're a bunch of wackadoos. You know, that's not helpful for anybody. You can just say, I, I grew up with a different faith belief, and then I came to understand more of the Word of God, so make sure that we're not attacking people. Don't be confrontational. You need to get saved or you're going to hell. Turn or burn, you sinner. Again, not helpful, not helpful. Explain how your life has changed and the good things that God has done. I've heard some people give their testimony and it sounds like they want to go back. They're just longing, longing for those days. No, stop that. Think about how your life has changed and God has been so good and share those things with people and leave your listener wanting to hear more, not less. If they want to keep that conversation going, that's awesome. But there's nothing more uncomfortable than being stuck in a conversation you can't get out of that is just like you want to run and you're shutting down and you stopped listening to them a long time ago and now there's cartoons playing in your head and nothing they're saying is making any sense. So don't, we shouldn't be that person. So leave them wanting to hear more, not less. Home Bible studies are not difficult to teach. Almost anybody can do it. What a new convert has received, they can convey to others through teaching the word of God in the home. Well, I don't know a lot about the Bible. I'm afraid they're going to ask me questions. I don't know. We're never, ever going to know everything that's in this word. We're always going to be learning. We're always going to be studying. And the best way to learn, honestly, is teaching. There's never been a time when we have sat down to teach that I haven't walked away and learned something new. The more you dig into the word, the more alive it becomes to you. So don't let that stop you. If somebody asks you a question you don't know, say, that is a great question. I don't know the answer right now, but I'll find out and I'll let you know and then follow up on that. Don't let that intimidate you. You can do this. You got this. And besides, people talk about all kinds of stuff. They don't have any idea what they're talking about nowadays. So for you to say, I will find an answer, that's awesome. That's awesome. And they'll listen to you and they'll say, hey, you're somebody I can trust. And you're honest enough to tell me you don't know the answer. You're not just making something up on the fly. Teaching a home Bible study is not preaching a sermon, but it's relating the beautiful truths of God's word as revealed in the Bible. A home Bible study teacher does not need to be a minister, a Bible school graduate, or even a Christian of long standing. You don't have to be in the church for 52 years before you can teach a Bible study. But those who have been saved for years and those who are new converts can always teach a Bible study very effectively after just a short time period of training. Uh, when a home Bible study is used and placed in the hands of a fervent Christian, you suddenly have a proven method of reaching others and leading them to Christ. After our own walk with God, nothing is more exciting or rewarding than God using us to reach those for his kingdom. It is of utmost importance that we reach the lost. However, it is of equal importance that we disciple and we train the new converts. A person who helps to bring someone to Christ should not feel that his responsibility to that soul is just over. Okay, I did my part and walk away. But with proper understanding and training, a more mature Christian can then go and disciple new converts and establish them deeper in the faith so they in turn will also go and fulfill the Great Commission. Jesus taught everywhere, the marketplace, temple, synagogue, home and even a hillside. Acts 1 and 8 again, but you will receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you shall be witnesses. The early church reached their generation by teaching in the home. The success story has not been repeated in this current generation. What is the most important thing in our lives? What is it that eats up all our time? If sharing the gospel with the lost is secondary or even further down the list, then we no longer have to wonder why God is not using us more in this way. When we have a relationship with God, a true love relationship with God, love for the lost will automatically flow out of that. We are not reaching the lost so that God will love us more. We are loving God more so that he can use us to reach the lost. So fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with his word. Don't, don't study just to teach, but study to know him. The more you'll know him, his character, his heart, his desire, his, his love, 
the more it will just flow out of you like a river of living water. And it will just splash onto everybody that you're meeting. And when you go to speak to someone, you won't even know that you wouldn't have any thought that you were going to say anything. And something will come out. And that person, how did you know I was thinking that? There are people I have met that honestly think I can read a mind. And you've met them too. They're like, how did you know that? And, you, and all you did was walk up and say, I'm praying for you. And, and today's going to be, and how, how did you know that? Because when you're in love with Jesus, he'll tell you things. He'll show you things even when you're not aware of it. And he'll use you to reach those lost. And I know you guys have all had stories like that. Um, where God has just used you in a powerful way and you didn't even see it coming. But it's because you have that walk with God. So if you'll keep your walk with God, number one priority, he's going to flow through you and make you a conduit. Let's ask ourselves some questions. Why did God save me? What does he want of me more than anything else? How do I fit into world evangelism? The answer to all of these questions is wrapped up in witnessing and sharing the gospel. When God gathers souls into his kingdom, I sure do hope and pray that there's some of those souls that have my fingerprints on them. That there's some of that harvest from the field that, that I've passed by a time or two. That each one of you look and you're like, oh, there's that one. I remember working with them. I prayed with them. I remember ministering to them. That's what we want. I, I want to go to heaven. I want to see Jesus. I want to be with him. But, man, I don't want to do that by myself. I need to take somebody with me, as many as we can. Let's take people with us. Let's reach as many as we can. Share the gospel each and every day, not feel like our self-worth and image is dependent on their response, but just say, Lord, if you ask me to witness, if you ask me to preach the gospel everywhere, regardless of their response, Lord, I'm going to do it. Because I know that once that seed's planted, I might not see it happen, but somebody else is going to come along, and they're going to start witnessing to them, and it's going to water that seed that was planted a long time ago. Matthew 10 and 8, as I close, Freely you have received, freely give. We have received this beautiful, great treasure, this beautiful promise of salvation, and we cannot withhold it from anyone. So tell everyone you meet, find a way, have the conversations, start doing it. It might feel awkward if you're not used to it, but you'll get over it, I promise, and it will feel amazing. It is addictive when you start reaching people and you see their eyes light up and you see their hearts come al alive and they start asking you more questions than what you even envisioned. You're going to hear no, but you know what? You're going to hear some yeses. So in Jesus' name, I'll turn it back to Brother Bob. And he goes for the pin. I claim the victory. As you stand. Nowadays, everybody is on that stupid internet. And all of a sudden, everybody is a biblical genius. But not all the stuff on the internet is genius. You know those 180s I do once a month? I mean, there are people who take lyrics of songs and they use them like they're Bible verses. Stupid stuff like that. And if we're not careful, they're going to pull something off the internet, something stupid. And it sounds good. It sounds scriptural, but it's not. And they're going to run it by you, and you're going to sit there and, oh. So you got to be careful nowadays. See, back in the old days, you know, when people didn't know the scriptures, it was almost better because we could tell them the truth. It got a little bit more hairy when you had people who were coming from other Christian denominations. Then all you had to do, though, is point out the scriptures for Acts 2.38 and any other of the verses that we believe and hold in our heart. So as we close tonight, uh, 
just remember uh, Pastor and his family as they're coming home. It'll be great to see them again. They'll be, I mean, you go on vacation, that's nice, but sometimes it's nice to get back home. So uh, we're going to close in prayer in Jesus' name. We thank you, mighty Lord, mighty God, for meeting with us tonight. In Jesus' name, mighty Lord, as you keep your hands on the coxes as they come home from a well-earned vacation, in Jesus' name. Bless them, mighty God, in Jesus' name. Let us come Sunday morning blessed and ready to meet you at your altar in Jesus' name. We thank you and we praise you, mighty Lord, for your word that we received tonight. Let it get into our heart and let us help spread it to everyone around us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You are dismissed.